What's up, everybody? Trey Biddy with Hogsports.com. Nuts and bolts show today. We're going to jump right into USC and Eric Musselman, probably abbreviated. We're going to go fast, 20, 25 minutes or so. We'll talk a little bit about spring football as well. They just wrapped up practice 10, but we're going to talk a lot about Eric Musselman and USC. Mashed potatoes and gravy. You guys can see all the ways to watch and listen down here. Plenty of ways to watch and listen. Tune in, give us a five-star review, all that stuff. Subscribe. Hog Sports right now, 60% off at HAWGsports.com. If you've been following along with us on the Raiders Edge, and you know everything that's been going on. You haven't had to sip through the crap of everything that's going on. You've been able to just get reliable information. Man, damn, we have a good time when it hits the fan at hogsports.com. 60% off right now, HAWGsports.com. Come check out what all we've got going on the Razor's Edge message board. Uh, 12 cents a day, guys. 83 cents a week, 358 a month. Build at $42.96 for the whole year to get the number one independent source on Arkansas sports and recruiting, HAWGsports.com. So, Musselman and USC, this is something that's been – the worst kept secret, I guess, out there in college basketball right now as we hit Final Four and uh, a dead period in recruiting. So I guess it's a good time for coaching searches and things like that. But, uh, you know, there was so much stuff going on with all the other job openings and stuff, and we tried to guide you down the right path with that. Musselman and SMU, just not going to happen. DePaul, not going to happen. Louisville, not going to happen. But we always knew about Musselman from the time that he got at Arkansas that if there was a right West Coast job open up, if you remember on the show I was saying if the dominoes fall a certain way and a West Coast job opens up, obviously we're looking at that USC job, then maybe that's something that he would really consider making a play at, and that is what's happened Arkansas will probably find out about it a little bit before he thought. I mean, just last week, they're putting together a robust recruiting plan, you know, for the transfer portal, got plans and uh, feeling good about all that kind of stuff. And then all, all this, you know, develops. And we, of course, saw that SMU job and USC coach going to SMU, how the dominoes could fall there. Uh, we talked about that a little bit, obviously, last week and on the last show as well. So, um, Musselman and USC. It's not a big surprise. I mean, sources have been telling me this for a while. And, you know, just for his replacement idea, because that's where we're moving on, right? We're going to throw out a hot board, right, as soon as this is officially announced and everything um, that it's happening, which it is. Uh, But, you know, there's been so much talk about Chris Beard over at Ole Miss. And uh, people have told me for over a month now that if something happened and the Arkansas job opened up, that – Chris Beard would be highly interested. Obviously, there's a lot of connections with him being at UALR before knowing the power brokers down there in the Little Rock area. I think you guys know some of the people that I'm talking about and what Arkansas is capable of. You know, Chris Beard is 51 years old. Went to Texas, uh, you know, was a, a GA there. We had an interesting call on Drive Time Sports about a guy that talked to him back in the day when he was a GA at Arkansas and just, you know, how much respect he had for the Arkansas program. We know that Arkansas was in the mix for Beard when he was making his Final Four run, his national championship game run back in 2019 when he was at Texas Tech. The problem was he just kept on winning and winning and winning, and Arkansas eventually felt like they needed to make a move, and they moved on Eric Musselman, which was a great move, by the way. Eric Musselman has been good for Arkansas basketball. I'm not sitting here all pissed like some people are. I see some people that are furious, and I get it. You know, you're getting left at the altar kind of feeling like, we can fire you, we can fire you, but don't you dare leave us. You know, that's – I can remember when Houston Nutt was getting quartered by Nebraska, everybody was like, well, I wanted him to hire an offensive coordinator. I don't want him to leave. You know, and that was kind of the sentiment then and maybe a little bit now. But the same vein, I think there's a lot of people that are like, okay, you know, Let's move on. Let's let's turn the page. And the reason we're able to talk like that is because of the job that Arkansas is, which is a great job. I'd argue that it's better than any job that's been open. Michigan, Louisville. I'm sure I'm getting Michigan, Louisville fans in the comments below. But, you know, DePaul, of course, SMU, USC. It's a better job than all of those. And why is he moving? Why is he leaving the SEC school for USC? It just comes down to where he's been, where he's from, and, you know, what we've always kind of known with Eric Musselman. Like, you always say – you know, the guy's not going to be here forever. He's just not. And, you know, you can look at it from his perspective, too, from having a 16-17 and 17 record this year, his first losing season as a head coach. And what if he has a losing season next year? You know, what if the pieces don't fall right? You know, people always talk about the honeymoon period's over. The honeymoon's over. Like, you don't get a divorce when the honeymoon's over, right? Is everybody getting divorced right when the honeymoon ends? Why is that a phrase? You still have marriage and kids and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, for uh, this particular – 
situation. You know, you could see why it made some sense for him if the right position opened up, why he would leave Arkansas. And, um, you know, there's been all kinds of talk behind the scenes. guys. I mean, like everybody I've talked to the last few days, um, everybody has a source, everybody has somebody connected. And we've got good connections within the program. Connor Goodson's done a great job of guiding people down the right path of what's actually going on with Arkansas basketball at Hog Sports. Um, our new basketball guy done a really just hit the ground running on that. So, uh, Arkansas is a great job, and a lot of it's because of what Eric Musselman did at Arkansas. Like, nobody's going to pretend that they didn't enjoy Elite Eight runs, that they didn't enjoy going to the Sweet 16 and beating Kansas, you know, all of those things. And it's been tumultuous this last year, obviously. The season did not go out, you know, play the way that you thought it would when you were back beating Purdue. Beating, Remember beating Purdue in an exhibition game? How electric Bud Walton Arena was? I was there for that. The Duke game in Bud Walton, I was there for that one too. I remember feeling all the heat. Suddenly, why am I so warm? I look around, it's just a bunch of sweaty students packing the aisles ready to rush the court. You know, it's amazing that it came from that to where things ended up with Arkansas basketball uh, this year. But, you know, as of last week, they're putting together robust transfer portal plan. Um, got a, you know, they got a commitment from Josh Cohen, obviously, and things change quickly in college basketball. I would expect, I mean, something today you know i would not be surprised if something today was announced on muscleman to usc now the question is after that where does arkansas go and as i said before arkansas is a not a good but a great basketball job it was a good job with so much potential when eric muscleman took it initially now it's a great job and everybody knows like if you're an arkansas fan and and other people found out i think but People in Arkansas know that for 20 years before Eric Musselman came, uh, during the mediocre periods, Stan Heath, John Pelfrey, um, you know, uh, Mike Anderson, who who took it up a, a level, but never reached the part. Like the off season of basketball, like, and that's one of the things I love about the job I do. And and basketball off season, football off season, is almost like another sport with recruiting and transfer portal and coaching changes and all that kind of stuff. It's almost like another sport, and um, that's that's where things get really interesting I mean for us and so like just following along with all all the stuff that goes on there and keep people abreast of what's happening is just um it can be really entertaining and coaching searches are just such a roller coaster such up and down people have been talking to me about Chris Beard obviously Will Wade's another one that's come up you know Chris Beard's got some you know things in his past Will Wade has some things in his past uh, you know like show calls threats all that kind of stuff um you know People have been talking about Jerome Tang over at Kansas State. Has he been a head coach long enough? He had an Elite Eight run, but like, has he been a head coach long enough to make people feel comfortable? Because people remember Stan Heath being hired after one year, you know, making an Elite Eight run one year as a head coach, and it just didn't pan out. Like, people want a proven coach, and I think that that is a possibility at Arkansas. We know Eric Musselman made four point two million dollars a year, which is twelfth highest among uh, FBS coaches. You want to break it down. I would say that, um, you know, 10 of those guys ahead of him, 11 of those guys ahead of him have either a better resume than Musselman had or have arguably a similar resume that he has. And there's a few guys that are, that are paid less than him that have better resume, guys that have, like, been to multiple Elite Eights and uh, – you know, even a Final Four like Dana Altman, you know, makes less. Or Tony Bennett at Virginia, who's won a national championship, makes less money. So Eric Musselman was definitely fairly compensated for the resume that he has, what he's done at Arkansas, and $4.2 million, solid coaching salary. I mean, again, top 12 money was at like six in the SEC, but still top 12 money. And, you, I, I mean, you argue like Bruce Pearl and, you know, some of the other guys, obviously there's guys with, with slightly better or better resumes than Musselman has that are, that are paid more than him. But Arkansas will pay top dollar. I think the NIL situation will get sorted out. I think that they'll – the hunts have been great, by the way. The hunts have been great to Arkansas basketball. Uh, but, you know, in Arkansas Edge is more of a startup trying to get there. But if they can get Arkansas Edge, matching what the hunts have been able to do. And, you know, I, I, I think they're drive for five. They've added, you know, a few hundred more uh, uh, members and stuff. But, you know, there are people also that donate tons of money, six-figure money also, not just like on a $50 a month plan, which is great. You get enough people doing that. You get 5,000 people doing $50 a month. You got $3 million there. And again, that's for, for everything. Basketball needs about $3 million. Basketball needs about $3 million. I think people will recognize the crux of the situation, the importance of this coaching change situation, and will step up to the plate. That's what I think is going to happen for Arkansas NIL, ensuring the next coach that, hey, 
we're there from you from a, a support standpoint. Not only are you going to make a great salary, we're there for you from a support standpoint. Our sources tell us that there have been a ton of agents for really good coaches reaching out to Arkansas. Now, again, a lot of people – I mean, everybody's looking at Chris. Like, that's everybody seems to be like the guy everybody wants, right? And it's not him, and it's Will Wade, you know. Um, you know, Jans I hear over at Mississippi State. I hear a lot of names out there. And you have to be careful with agents because a lot of them are posturing, trying to get their message out. And speaking of posturing, like, was that what – is that what Hunter Yurchek was doing? Like, so – those guys at the One Star Podcast like reached out to me on the 26th. That's, that was already like scheduled. Like before he put out the must bus, are you still here? Before that video went out on the 28th, which again, all that was very odd. If your check pulls off the right hire, then it's all going to look like, okay, your check's playing chess. If he doesn't, it's going to look like he's lost his marbles. Um, I think your check got wind of everything going on at USC probably before Arkansas staff, Eric Musselman was ready, but it's been very interesting inside the basketball offices, almost a sense of like going through the motions and some people have like half the people know and the other half act like they don't know, you know, I mean, all, like all kinds of stuff like that. Um, you know, what we're hearing, like in some of the stuff that Connor's been able to report on, but um, you know, I don't, I think that you'll have like a lot of those assistants go with him. You know, obviously his sons, um, you know, Keith Smart out here is like trying to get a head coaching job, but I mean, you know, there's no guarantee on that. Uh, but um, you know, there's, um, yeah, uh, Lee, I think will go. Um, you know, and I think there are other. I don't think Ronnie Brewer will go. You know, we'll see what Ronnie does, but I don't think that he would go. He's being, an, you know, being an Arkansas guy. He's not an LA guy. Um, I get the sense, the idea of going back home and and all that stuff and wanting to be back closer to your people. Um, I understand that, and I think we've all kind of seen that with Musselman. I don't like that. You know. He's leaving, but like, how else was he going to go? Like, he was either going to get fired, he was going to take another head coaching job. He's only fifty nine years old. He's got a lot of a lot left in the tank. Um, I don't hold like this ill will towards Musselman because um, you know I know like what kind of guy he is. I know he lives on edge. I've said before he's insane in a lot of ways, and you have to be. And it's, sometimes it's hard to shut that off when you live on edge all the time. And I've seen a lot of coaches come through, whether not just head coaches, but, you know, coordinators, assistant coaches who just live on edge. They're relentless. They're dedicated to their craft and you can't shut it off. And we've heard stuff like, you know, difficult on assistants and hard to work with and, you know, a pain in the butt and all this kind of stuff. And that's just kind of sometimes what you get. I don't imagine Nick Saban is, I'm not saying like he's Nick Saban of college basketball or anything like that. I'm just saying like cut from that kind of cloth. Nick Saban, I don't think, is like uh, a pleasure to work with every single day or was when he was still coaching. You know, that's just – you know, I th- think Bobby Petrino was just uh, – like when he was at Arkansas before, everybody was just like, man, I really – really just a kumbaya situation at Arkansas working under Bobby Petrino. No, the guy lived on edge. You just can't you can't shut that kind of stuff off, and you kind of have to have that. You kind of have to be um, – you know, I'm not saying anybody's a sociopath or, you know, crazy or anything like that. I'm just saying, like, you have to have – you've got to be a little different, you know, maybe even, like, socially just – just different, and, and Musselman has that. But he was always good to us, like, media-wise. Like, he would, you know, didn't take losing well, just, like, you know, sulking and stuff like that. But I get it, you know. I, I would rather him be like that than just, like, with a smile on his face talking about the loss. Um, that's just who Musselman was. So, yeah, go to USC. That's fine. Um, you know, nobody ever likes to be left at the altar, but I don't think that anybody um, at Arkansas – you know, people are going to be upset, obviously, but I think also people have the sense that this is a hell of a job. A lot of people say it's the second best job in the SEC. I don't disagree with that. Um, the support is there. The fan support is there. The salary is there. I think the NIL will be there. Um, I know the hunts will be there. I know there's some others that will be there. I know there's some others that are interested in being there. Um, and now I think people will recognize the situation and step up to the plate in Arkansas and recognize that, you know, basketball is important to this state. Um, you know, this is still very much a football school, but basketball, basketball, has, Arkansas just has so much potential in basketball. This state produces well on a per capita level. It's not a big state, but you look at some of the talent that comes out of this state, it's pretty damn impressive for the size of the state. And it's like year after year, there's just talent coming out of this state. So um, there is that aspect of it that you can absolutely get some great talent from this state and in the region. Um, and the support is there. Fans will show up. They will give you the benefit of the doubt and they will be there for you. And they've shown that time and time again, you know, 25 years, 
At the same time, like it's important to say this again. All those guys I mentioned, John Pelfrey, who sucked here, uh, Stan Heath, who just didn't quite ever get over the hump, Mike Anderson, kind of the same way, but maybe a little bit more. And, and obviously there's a special place in people's heart for Mike Anderson for what he did you know, back in the 90s when he was at Arkansas in the 80s. Um, but none of those guys were able to get Arkansas over the hump. Okay, And Mike Anderson had a, a lead eight to his credit before he got to Arkansas. Um, I think that's right, right? And maybe a sweet 16 at UAB too. I think that's right, but just never got over the hump at Arkansas. So it's imperative that Arkansas go out and get the right coach because all those other coaches had tremendous facilities. Mike Anderson's the only one that had the practice facility, which is fantastic. But all those other guys had the facilities, the fan support, the tradition, all those things behind them too and just weren't able to get it done. So, But Musselman did some things at Arkansas that hadn't been done in a quarter century. And um, for me, I'm, I'm good with that. And I know that the place um, that he is leaving – it's better right now than when he found it. The the trick is you got to rebuild the roster. You obviously had Bayfall hit the hit the portal today, but you've got you know Tremont Mark, Caleb Battle. I mean, you've got some guys. Um, you know, Trevin Brazil. You've got some guys that are still on the team. We'll see what happens with them. Obviously, you know when Will Wade left uh, or when he was fired from LSU, they lost the whole roster and they had to start all over again. So we'll see how things play out in that regard. Um, I think I said pretty much everything I want to say on that. I mean, go to Hog Sports, H-A-W-G-Sports.com. Follow along with us on the Razor's Edge. I mean, we, we don't, we're not, like, putting out, like, stories and stuff, like getting on Twitter. Like, I don't work for Elon Musk and Twitter and stuff. So, um, you know, I work for 24-7 Sports, and we are putting all our stuff on our VIP subscribers. We sift through the crap for you. We put out the real information, and proud of the job that we've done there. And like I said, man, when it hits the fan, that's when we shine at Hawk Sports. Uh, we keep it entertaining. I know how to run a coaching search, and that's coming. And um, I've been at this for 21 years as of last month and covered a lot of coaching searches. We're going to make it fun. We're going to we're gonna ride the roller coaster if there is one, but we're going to make it fun. We're going to put the rumors out there. We're going to make sure those are separated from facts. And um, anybody who's been with us at Hawk Sports knows – the fun that we have following a coaching search, keeping you up to date uh, in, in the interaction that we have over there. So go check us out. Again, 60% off. Let's jump over to spring football real quick. Um, now, today was day 10. Taylor Green didn't have a really good day today. This was the first day that I would say, like, man, just didn't have a very good day. And I don't know if it was the weather or what it was, but, like, you know, just throwing balls – especially on the right sideline for some reason, just like five, eight yards out of bounds. Stuff. It's like, where, what's going on here? What are you doing, Taylor? Uh, Through like three interceptions. There was another one that should have been intercepted at the middle field. I think it was uh, Jaden Johnson. Uh, Jalen Braxton had a pick. I think Jaden Allen picked him off uh, in one-on-one stuff. And somebody else around the goal line picked him off. So not, not a great day for him today. And that was, you know, it's a little discouraging. You know, the scrimmage, he was under 50% passing also, but he did have two touchdown passes. He threw a bad interception uh, towards the end of it. Overall, Talon has been pretty damn solid, though. I think he's been a pretty solid quarterback for him throughout the spring. He's the starting quarterback. They haven't named him. Bobby Petrino, basically, I don't know if he let it slip out, but he you know pretty much said he is uh, on Tuesday. But he's the starting quarterback. I think when you bring his legs into the equation also, it's going to change a lot of stuff. Um, he throws a pretty ball. Today he was just a little off. I don't know what it was, but he was off. Um, so we'll see how he bounces back on Saturday. Not going to be like a full-scale scrimmage. They're going to do more situation stuff. I believe all that's open to the public, but um, it'll be in the stadium. But it'll be more situational type stuff. When I was leaving there, they were painting the field, uh, putting the uh, putting the paint on the numbers and everything, getting it ready. So, But, yeah, Talon, um, you know, a lot hinges on him. I'll say this about the offensive line. You know, like last year the offensive line was just getting smoked by the D-line. And, you know, a lot of it was like, yeah, the offensive line needs help, but, uh, man, this D-line is amazing. And the truth of it was you know, the D-line was pretty good, and they're still pretty good. But uh, the offensive line was just bad, and that's that's what really – I mean, that's what you get from, you know, playing against yourself all, all you know, all, all spring and all fall camp. Uh, but I will say that I don't see as much – penetration from the defensive line as I did last year and it's for a large part the same guys out there you still got Landon Jackson and Eric Gregory and Cam Ball and Keevy Rose and um, you know some of the Nico Dabier who played a little bit last year wasn't a starter you lost Trajan Jesco Jeff Cote obviously John Morgan Tank Booker some of those guys uh, but for the most part it's the same guys so I think it's a better offensive line than they had last year but I don't know that uh, like 
I'm not going to say like it's a good offensive line. Bobby Petrino thinks they can run the ball, though. He said that after the practice, you know, breaking tackles, saw some of that stuff, hitting the holes good. I think Jaquin and Jackson will end up being your starting back. I just think the experience that he brings, the toughness, the grit, the idea that he wants to prove himself playing injured last year and having to listen to people say stuff like he's just not as good as he was or he's not this or that, um, you know, I think is, you know, in his head a little bit and wanting to prove himself in the SEC. Runs well between the tackles. I think Braylon Russell's got a really bright future at Arkansas. The guy's thighs are as big around as my waist. Really powerful. Got some good speed. You got R Dub. You know, obviously uh, at running back too, and Isaiah Augusta, some other guys too. Dominic Johnson. Uh, but I really think, like uh, Petrino kind of pointed out, that you know Jaquindon and uh, Rashad DeBinion, those maybe. Two guys battling first place there, and I, I think that Jaquindon ends up being your guy. Skill guys, I mean, they're in good shape as skill guys. I mean, Jaquindon's a proven back. You know, obviously he needs to stay healthy, I think. Um, but I think he could be like a, a guy that gets – the bulk of the yard is for him. Uh, he, I don't think he catches the ball a whole lot. Um, I like what they have at tight end. The skill spots are fine. They are. Um, Isaiah Satania, I think, is going to take a big leap forward. Loved hearing Bobby Petrino say words like Joe Adams and Jarius Wright when you know when talking about Satania. That would be fantastic, obviously. But um, you know you got you got Satania there, who I think is going to play a really nice role for him. Andrew Armstrong, you know you know what you have in him. He's had a really great spring until he pulled his hammy uh, a week ago. You got Tyrone Broden, who I think is a really um, pick things up. He's he's definitely thickened up. He's bigger. He's not so you know just long and slim. But they've got some good wide receivers. They've got some really good tight ends. I like what I see in Gums. Obviously Luke has. We know what he can be in another year. You know uh, under his belt he should be even better. Uh, I like Puska also at tight end. I think that they have some skill players. So the question becomes, can they block for him? Is the offensive line, if the offensive line can be there for him, we know what Bobby Petrino will do on offense. I don't think it'll be a lot like 2008 because 2008 they're out there rolling freshman Joe Adams and Chris Gregg and Greg Childs and Jarius Wright. You know, just a lot of young guys out there in an offense that you know a guy like Casey Dick wasn't necessarily um, you know used to running in the past. Um, so I think like with a more veteran group, you're going to see. Um, them start faster than they did in 2008. Guys, you can remember, like, Western Carolina almost dropped that game last uh, in 2008. Um, Louisiana Monroe was another one. Got smoked by, like, Texas, Alabama, Florida, like one after another, you know, and then finally started getting things going. They don't have that luxury this year. They go to Stillwater in week two. They go to Auburn in week four, Okay. They got to get it in order. So that's kind of my thoughts on the offense. I think the skill guys are there for them to be good enough. Um, maybe Andrew Armstrong's an NFL type of guy. Maybe Davion Dozier one day is an NFL type of guy. I think he's got potential. Um, Tyrone Broden is certainly intriguing to me. Satania, I, you know, I'm ready to see Satania put that speed to work on the field, not just on special teams. And I think that we're going to see that. And I think I think they're in good shape at tight. I, I mean, I know I'm just repeating myself, but I really I, I feel like they've got some skill guys. The question becomes up front, like, can they get it done up there? I think they're going to be better pass pro. You know, last year the running back sucked at pass pro. Tight end sucked at pass pro. Uh, you're not going to see the field under Petrino if you can't pass block. I remember him saying a long time ago, if you can't pass pro, you can't play for me. Um, switching over to defense, let's talk about secondary first. Nice addition to Marquise Robinson. I think he's going to help him. Um, you know, Selman Bridges, I still think, has a little bit of a ways to go. The freshman who's the top recruit in the class. Still think he's got some work to do. He's running third team. But I could see him eventually being a guy that plays a good role for him. Jalen Braxton's had a fantastic spring, just fantastic overall, really. So taking that up a, ne- a level from where he was last year, he started – Six games for him last year, played nine. I think he had a shoulder the last couple of games. But, um, you know, Braxton. And then on the other side, um, you know, you got kind of a battle with Keon Stewart, Jaheim Singletary. I think Singletary, from what I hear, people talk about him kind of like they talked about Jaden Johnson last year. So uh, I I think overall the secondary is going to be comparable to what it was last year. Okay, it should be. You know, even though you lose McLaughlin, you lose uh, Al Walcott, you know, pretty much all your other main players are back. Uh, plus, you got guys that are a year older, and you have to factor that in to to being better overall. Let's see what this message is. I got. Uh, okay, this guy tells me USC AD is in Arkansas, so it looks like it's done. Yeah, there was a plane coming from um, LA to Arkansas. So uh, anyway, 
that's where things are in the secondary. Hudson Clark's back. Jaden Johnson's back. I think you got Danico Slaughter, the Tennessee transfer, who's been running with the first group at nickel ahead of snacks. I think that's just kind of get him integrated with that first group. I think you'll see that group kind of four guys in three spots rotating around a lot. Maybe Danico is the guy that's at safety. Nickel kind of comes in as that sub. All those guys kind of play in a similar number of snaps, like we saw last year. Um, you know, and you also had um, Snacks Johnson playing corner some last year too. So. Um, yeah, that's uh, pretty much what I think about the secondary. I'd like to see an older veteran linebacker, but I really like Brad Spence. You know, lining up in that mint front also I think can mitigate some things that we'll talk about on the defensive line. But, you know, putting him out as a wide nine, um, you know, you got the two ends of the four eye and a head up nose maybe mitigate some of the issues that you could have from a depth standpoint at defensive end because not that you don't have a 3D. It's just when you talk about freshman ends, and that's where your third team is, it's Charlie Collins and KV on Henderson, two four-star composite guys, uh, really high regarded, who can get after the quarterback. But, you know, freshman ends tend to get buckled a lot in the run game. You just kind of go right at them. So that's maybe a little bit of a concern there. But I think they can alleviate some of that stuff. Um, they also work Nico Davier in that spot. Kavion Henderson works at that um, that buck spot, the wide nine. So, but at linebacker, Xavier Sori, I think Spence could be a guy that racks up a ton of tackles and a ton of sacks. I think he could be that guy for him. Um, they don't call it like the Mike and the Will. It's the the money and the Mac now. <laughs> I'm not sure which one is which, but it's all like interchangeable. Um, I just worry a little bit about the youth overall in the linebacker. Hopeful, but worry about the youth. I think they probably should add one more guy. But Sorey's look good. Spence's look good. Dean's look pretty good. Uh, Sanford's look pretty good. Um, Henley's actually been working up there a little bit more lately. But it's just a young group overall, an experienced group overall. Encouraged, but not sold yet. Defensive line. They got a good two deep. They're solid at two deep. And five years ago, that's great. But now in the portal age, you need to have three. You need to have like five ready to go defensive tackles. I think they're going to add two more defensive tackles. They just get a little small when you get past that second group. You know, the first two groups, you got Eric Gregory, you've got um, Cam Ball, who I think maybe has next level ability. Eric Gregory, probably one of the more unappreciated team uh, players on this team. And you got Ian Drafford, who goes 6'5, 380. And Kiwi Rose, who played a lot for him last year. That's your two deep. But after that, you start getting into guys, you know, J.J. Hollingsworth, um, you know, um, Kyle Thompson, who's a walk-on. Um, uh, uh, Caleb James also, uh, who's transitioned from defensive end to defensive tackle. You just get really small all of a sudden there. You know, I'm not saying like Caleb James can't be a good player right now, but he's a little light right now for the interior. Need to go out and get somebody out of the transfer portal at defensive tackle. Defensive end, solid two deep. Freshman and the third team, I think they can mitigate some of that with some of the stuff they're talking about moving around, maybe doing some three, four looks, uh, the Mint, Oki package that they have, uh, all that stuff too. Um, Max Fletcher booming the ball on special teams, and Matthew Shipley was running with the first group at kicker for the first time today, practice 10. Uh, they're going to miss they'll miss Cam Little, uh, but I think Shipley can be a, a quality kicker for him. I'm just not like – He's going to set them on the next level. So, all right, everybody, summation. I said I'd go 25 minutes today, but I just want to wrap it up real quick. 60% off at Hog Sports, H-A-W-G-Sports.com. Follow this coaching search with us. It could be short. If it's not short, then it could be a roller coaster. But we're going to have fun with it, guys. I mean, coaching searches are fun. They just are. Uh, the highs and the lows, ride the roller coaster, enjoy it. And we're going to sift through all the crap. We're going to put the crap out there. We're going to make sure you know it's crap. But we're also going to put – the real news out there. We're just going to have a good time with it, okay? So that's where things are. Eric Musselman, USC, Arkansas, Chris Beard, Will Wade, Jerome Tang. Who's it going to be? We're going to find out. All right, everybody, thanks for joining me. This has been Trey Biddy with hogsports.com with a quick nuts and bolts mashed potatoes Hogsports live show. All right, everybody, thanks for joining me. We'll catch you next time. 